I will be speaking to you a little bit about a sample mimic design done in the AWR software in Microwave Office. Uh, this is a one watt X-band mimic. It was uh, designed by one of my colleagues. Uh, you'll see in the lower left there it says uh, Jim Carroll. He unfortunately had an, a little bit of a soccer injury, so uh, I'm here to present on his behalf as well. And I guess I should look at this and see how to advance everything right here. Yeah, it works, great. So uh, here's a little overview of what I'll be talking about in more detail. Um, so for this one, we're using a generic process. We didn't want to do anything specific to foundries. We're, we, what we'd call it is the AWR process. It's an imaginary foundry, but it's basically a 3-5 gas process is what it's representing. And as I mentioned, it's a one watt X-band uh, two-stage power amplifier. And what we're showing here is using the CRIPS methodology. Uh, I'll show you it's a little bit different than what you've seen before for using the CRIPS methodology. It's used in almost a reverse fashion. I'll explain that a little more. Uh, we cover match, matching network designs, talk about nonlinear simulation results, but the purpose of using the CRIPS design methodology is to avoid using those during the tweaking process, be, avoid using the nonlinear simulation because uh, through experience you might know how that could take some time. You're not going to be tuning on a circuit and running a power sweep, for example. And uh, as we go through this process, I'm going to touch on a few different, highlight a few different uh, features we have within our software to make the design process more smooth and more robust. So right here at first glance, uh, when you look at this, it does say circuit schematic. When you first look at it, it might look like a bad layout, you know, like a layout from sometime in the early 80s or something. But it is actually a schematic design. Uh, Right here, if I use the pointer, you can see these are actually just little pictures of each one of the devices. So it's a little easier to work your way around a schematic. Instead of just having symbols for everything, you actually have pictures of what it physically looks like uh, in real life. So it's a little bit easier to debug and make sure all your wiring is correct if you have a nice picture of your device rather than just a three-port black box or just a three-port bet symbol. And here is the layout, and as you can see, it kind of matches what we were looking at in the schematic. Looks almost the same, just a little more higher level of detail. There's a 2D view on the left, and then the 3D view on the right. If this design looks a little bit familiar, it means you were sitting here in the last presentation because I think this was on a couple of John's slides when he was talking about EM simulation. And uh, this slide also you might have seen before. Uh, this isn't specific to the design we're covering right now, but I wanted to kind of emphasize or show that you can do multi-technology design within this environment. Um, if you look at the previous slide, there is a, a little hint of that. Um, here you can see the interconnects. We're going from a board down to a mimic, but to kind of show that you know it can be more than just that little interconnect here. It's a whole module. And then we have the, over here in this area, we have the full mimic design connected, all done in one single simulation. So. Um, I like to describe this type of uh, this type of design as very microwave or very microwavy because we're actually using distributed elements. We're not doing any kind of lump components. We're doing X band, which is relatively high frequency, uh, especially if you're used to talking to RF people who are in the you know one two gigahertz. Here we're up at around eight to twelve gigahertz design. Um, the interconnect matching is very important. You just can't simply draw a trace from A to B and assume it's a DC short and an RF short. Everything you draw on that mimic will affect your performance when you get up to these frequency ranges. And so it's very important to have this high precision in your simulations. Every little bit needs to be simulated in some regard, whether it's done using a mathematical model or whether it's done using electromagnetic simulation or as far as a 3D electromagnetic simulation. Uh, to kind of kick things off with the design simulation, you want to start with linear. A uh, few reasons for this. One, it's simpler. And two, it's fast. You can, you can do all kinds of circuit manipulations, and you get your answers just like that. It's pretty much real time. As fast as you can click that simulation button, you see your results on the graph. And you can start at DC, go out to 50 gigahertz, no problem. Uh, the last bullet point here mentions that we we're, we're going to use the CRIPS method to do the nonlinear performance. Because as I mentioned a little bit a moment ago, if you're doing a full nonlinear harmonic balance simulation, or even a transient simulation for that matter, it's going to take some time to get those results. When you're still in the tweaking phase of your simulation, if you want to get nonlinear results but with linear speed, you can use the CRIPS method. And I'll get into a little more detail about that in a moment. Um, the designer for this mimic used 
classic matching techniques, um, leveling, uh, using the small signal parameters, using conjugate matching, things like that. Uh, because this is a power amplifier, we're looking at the output matching network first. Um, if you're doing something linear, maybe you'll look at the input first. But we start output, then iterate to back to input, and back over to output again, kind of to go through the full cycle of your matching synthesis, if you will. Um, and we start off with kind of a lumped approach. Just take some RLC type matching. Um, as an example, uh, one, of our, one of the tools within the software is called iMatch. It's intelligent matching uh, circuit synthesis, where you simply give it a starting impedance and an ending impedance and hit the go button, and it creates a circuit for you. And as I mentioned, it's just using a lumped approximation. It's a little bit hard to see, a little fuzzy there, but what we have is just a, a Series L shunt C three-stage network. And, um, and so after you've gotten this stage done, then you have an idea of where you want your match to be. Kind of, if you will, you can kind of visualize what your circuit might look like after you've done this RL, this, uh, sorry, LC matching network kind of help you get an idea of how much impedance you want to get. You can start to visualize in your mind what the circuit's going to look like. And so what we do is we create this output matching network based on those impedances and start to lay it out. And so what we did is, uh, as opposed to a traditional CRIPS method where you might look at your device characteristics in terms of your IV curves and your impedance to develop the matching network, here we've developed the matching network first and then use that to predict our nonlinear performance, which I'll get to in another slide or two. Um, before we go there, <clears throat> these are the, this is how the mod uh, output matching network was designed. Here we have uh, just a standard, a standard circuit approach where you have all these uh, mathematical models. These are all microstrip components. Uh, down here on the bottom left, <coughs> excuse me, you can see what the layout of this circuit looks like. And what we did is we used electromagnetic extraction uh, to give you a brief overview of what that means. We're taking that entire layout, throwing it over to an EM simulator, a 3D planar EM simulator, bringing those results back into the same schematic without actually leaving the schematic or altering our schematic in any, any way other than dropping in that little block there. So you don't have to worry about things like wiring up black boxes and getting things out of sync between your circuit schematic and your EM. So moving along, uh, here we actually look at a comparison. As I said, you know, we used EM extraction, so it's very easy to do a comparison. We have our circuit schematic simulation and our EM schematic, or our EM simulation. And here you can see there's uh, a little bit of a change. The models are not bad. You know, we're going up to 50 gigahertz here. At first glance, you might say, well, these curves, uh, for example, the, the blue one and this purple one are, are pretty far apart. But if you look at the scale on the left side, it's not that drastic. So we are getting <clears throat> a decent approximation with the mathematical models, but <clears throat> in order to achieve the higher level of accuracy that's required in this type of microwave design, you do want to run the extraction so you get the best answer possible. And so moving right along, um, part of the interstage matching network is we're using the same kind of techniques we use for the output match. Um, one thing to highlight here is there is this one particular model, it's called an M trace. This model right here is this actual this whole meandering trace going left, right, left, right. There. It's all captured in one model. It's something you it's layout driven. You can do that trace in the layout and all the bends, all the dis, the dis, discontinuity, all that is modeled within that single little element so your schematic doesn't get too cluttered with what would amount to probably about ten different elements if you did it in a traditional microstrip line microstrip bend, line bend, et cetera. Uh, one other nice feature uh, to highlight when doing this type of mimic design is this intelligent connectivity we have. So uh, if you look at the example on the right, over here we have a little bit of metal peeking out, and this has to connect to another multi-layer board. So when you connect those two, that one has to extrude in order to connect to the other one, or else you're going to have this tiny little gap between those two layers. So this, the software is intelligent enough to look at what it's connecting to and draw the necessary metal to make the appropriate RF connection. You can see it a little cl more clearly in this uh, model on the left. This is where they are actually connected together. And here we have a, uh, a top, top, call it metal one, 
layer, a trace coming in to a capacitor, and then the capacitor exits out, draws a via up to the top le level again and into that interconnect. So we're actually covering, you know, making sure all the connectivity is there. We're not accidentally shorting out our cap. We don't have to do anything like insert a via element. It's all done automatically. So um, as I mentioned a few times, we're, we're working with the CRIPS method. And um, you know, it's a, I'm not here to teach the CRIPS method or explain how it all works. I think we all did that in college or in our intro microwave classes beyond that. We've probably used it all before. If you've done power amplifier design, you use CRIPS method. And if not, well, it, is a, it can be, it's an older technique, um, but it is very effective, especially if you're trying to get a rough approximation of what you want your output match to be, and if you want to avoid long harmonic balance simulations. So this is how it was implemented in our environment. We have a certain area in the environment where you can use output equations. These can either be, a, this is a combination of equations. You can just simply do A plus B equals C type of equations, or you can specifically reference parts of your design, schematic parts. So these top two ones, uh, you kind of see those are green. Those are actually referring to different schematics. So we have a CRIPS output matching network. We're looking at the impedance, and second one, we're looking at the gain. Without going into too much detail about all the math that's going on, that's basically an equation representation of the CRIPS method, but it's being, instead of being used to approximate an output matching network, in this case, it's being used to approximate an output power. And what this does for you, it allows you to take your existing output matching network that you've created using your own techniques and saying, OK, am I in the ballpark? Did I do a decent job? If you're, you're, we're, we're doing a one watt design, so if I'm not seeing anywhere close to a watt, I've no, either I've done something tremendously wrong or I'm using the wrong model, I have to go back a step. Without investing too much into your simulation time, you're, getting a, you're gonna know if you're in the right spot. So say you're getting a watt out of this, you're gonna tweak some of these values, your, your impedances, see if you can maximize that, see if you can get maybe two watts out of it for at least the first pass simulation. This is a, a little bit of an overview of the whole nonlinear simulation approach. Once you've done your CRIPS methodology, then you can move on to nonlinear simulation, uh, more commonly referred to as harmonic balance. And uh, kind of on the left side is, is the shortcut. That's where you take your linear components and you say, all right, I don't need to do all this nonlinear stuff because I know this has linear behavior regardless of what I put into it. So this is the linear approach, goes straight down to the bottom. Everything else kind of has to go through this whole conversion of, you know, you have to you have to check all your voltages, you have to check all your currents, you have to make sure they balance on both sides of your, your band, and then it goes kind of iteratively through this process until it arrives on an answer within a certain tolerance. So all that being covered, let's actually look at what our results look like. So here, here we go with um, a few different measurements of more or less the same thing. Um, we did a, a linear simulation, which is down here in the red. And right up above it, we have the nonlinear simulation. You can see we have pretty good agreement there. Um, if you're comparing gain right here, this is on a 0 to 14 scale, so it's not too bad. And then we have our output power right up here. So we're going for x band. So if we're starting at maybe 8 gigahertz and going out, looks like we're pr doing pretty good out to about 11 gigahertz or so. If we wanted to do a full 8 to 12 band, which is conceivable, we'd have to probably do some modifications to our output matching network stretch out the band a little bit, probably lose a little bit in performance. But um, if you look at our output power scale, we are getting, uh, for the most part, above a watt throughout the band. And uh, here's what the power sweep looks like. Uh, you can see the efficiency isn't anything to brag about. You know, we're, we're still under about 20%. Uh, this kind of goes back to the models that were used in this simulation. As I mentioned, this is kind of a fictitious process. And uh, the models were actually initially designed to be running down in or the L band. So they're not performing that great up in the higher frequency ranges. So try not to hold that against the designer if you're only getting you know, less than 25% efficiency at best. So these are some of the features that were used to check the design. Uh, this is called the connectivity highlighter. I know it looks like a whole bunch, it looks like a candy store or something. It's just a, a whole bunch of colors on there. But really what it's doing for us is it's every color represents a DC connected trace. So if something's showing a different color, so that means we've somehow got a disconnect. So which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you gotta be careful on where you want your disconnects and where you want your connects. 
So here in the output match, you can see almost everything's green here, which is great. But um, on this inner stage, you know, there's a little discontinuity. discontinuity. For example, here we go from green, skip over to blue. And that's just because you know, a FET isn't literally connected together. There's uh, gaps between gate fingers and drain fingers. So that's to be expected. But this is a good visual tool. You press a button, everything highlights. You can actually see what is connected and what is disconnected. So it's not quite as, as uh, involved and as accurate as an LVS simulation, or as thorough, I should say. But it is a great way to check to make sure you haven't accidentally left something disconnected or accidentally shorted out an element you don't want shorted. And uh, speaking of LVS, you can also run an LVS simulation in our environment directly. We do have simulators that allow us to, ex to create any sort of net list, uh, you know, a whole laundry list of, of the different formats. Uh, for example, we run Caliber LVS essentially within our environment uh, for different foundries. And uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier just to reiterate that mtrace, mtrace element in the schematic is just a simple component right here. And in the layout, though, it can be as complex as this routed trace. And as I mentioned, it captures all the length of the line as well as the discontinuities of all the curves. Uh, switch views are a nice little feature, especially when you, if you have some measured data. It allows you to keep your schematic the same, but allow two different sets of data to represent a single item. In this particular example, it was uh, within an output FET, there was a ground via. So say you have a ground via circuit element, but you also happen to have measured data, and you want to be able to quickly compare the two. You can create a switch view for it. You don't have to modify your schematic at all. You just tell the measurement, hey, I want to use the measured data instead of the uh, regular simulated data or regular model. Uh, extraction, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Just to reiterate, you have components in your schematic. They have a layout representation. A quick and easy way to get an EM result in place of that mathematical model is to put in an extract block, sends the thing out to the EM, EM editor, um, EM simulator, puts the ports on for you, brings in the results without having to change your schematic keeps things in sync. Uh, something called shape preprocessing. When you have a multi-layer design, this is especially helpful. What it does is we have a whole set of rules right there, and it can simplify your design. In this particular example for that spiral we were looking at in the previous slide, we had almost 7,000 unknowns. It brought it down to almost half of the number of unknowns. And if you're familiar with EM simulators, that doesn't just mean it's going to run twice as fast. It's going to run you know, probably closer to four times as fast and get you the same answer. And to kind of wrap things up, um, what we did is we, one of our designers built a one watt PA broadband multi-stage amplifier. He used a kind of a reverse scripts method, if I can coin a phrase for that, and uh, used a lot of these uh, features in Microwave Office in order to make the design successful, to get through the design quickly and to get through it with the fewer mistakes. Uh, he used some of the layout features like the connectivity. Uh, he used simulation control. And probably the most important of all of them in terms of accuracy was using the EM extraction flow of simulating those components uh, directly in an EM simulator without modifying the schematic in any way. And just kind of a little highlight for AWR, this is our schedule for the various micro apps coming up. Have another one right after me, and then tomorrow afternoon and Thursday, of course. And if you have time, we welcome you to stop by our booth, 3.30, which is way over on the other side of the building here, or at least this room. And so feel free to stop by. Um, these are some of the things we'll be demonstrating. And our party is tomorrow night. And if you can make it to that too, that'd be great. So thank you. <laughs>